Dear Heavenly Father, I do ask that you open our, uh, our ears and our eyes to what you have to say to us, but particularly that you open our hearts and minds. Speak to us, Lord, for we're listening. Amen. Well, here's some pictures of Jesus letting the little children come to him. And I want you to have a think about what is wrong with them. Well, what's not wrong with them? They, none of them look like they are from Israel, do they? Not from the Middle East. The kids are all uh, white-skinned Anglo-Saxons. All the Jesuses look like they've stepped straight out of a uh, men's shampoo ad. They're a public relations disaster for Jesus, really. I mean, at least for blokes, they can put us off Jesus altogether. And they certainly put us off a passage like this, welcoming the little children. You know, we know he does it, but we hardly need a sermon on it, do we? Let's move on. But then there's others of us here, obviously many without kids, and you, perhaps you've tuned out already. You know, how does this, how's this going to be relevant for me? So let me assure you, I wouldn't be standing here if I didn't believe that God has something very specific to say to each of us here tonight. There's some stuff here about kids that we need to understand. But there's also some stuff here about salvation, about our attitude to God. So verse 17, Truly I tell you, anyone who does not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. So let's tune into five mistakes that we can make about children. Serious mistakes, spiritual mistakes. And I'm guessing without exception, your mistakes as they've been mine. They're on your outline in the bulletin, but let me run through them first. So number one is to treat children as VUPs. We'll explain that. Number two, to treat them as VIPs. Number three, treat them as Christians. Number four, treat them as non-Christians. Number five, not learn from them. Let me explain. So first mistake, to treat them as VUPs. Very unimportant people. Verse 15, people were also bringing babies to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. They rebuked them. Now Jesus, of course, they were working out by now as a very, very serious VIP. A very, very important person. And they were acting like his minders here, like his bodyguards, you know. And uh, the crowds were pressing in. And there they were in their black suits and Ray-Bans. You know, boys, we've got some underage fans approaching here, carried by mums and dads, execute Operation Turnaround. Copy that, Peter, executing. But Peter was also a VHP. Sorry, Jesus also a VHP, very humble person. And you see that because he includes the kids in his schedule. They're part of his plan, part of his concern. Do not hinder them. Let them come to me. The word babies in verse 15 has now changed to children. In verse 16, and kids of all sizes are welcomed in. Now, there might be a rebuke here for you or I as well. Let's think about this. How would you know if kids are unimportant to you? Well, how about this? You might greet adults when you meet them, but not have say hello to their children. You won't have kids on your prayer list. You know, the neighbours' kids, the nieces, the nephews, the, the kids of our missionary families. You might be too harsh with children, swat them away like flies, kind of cut them down with harsh words. You wouldn't care if... Kids were in offshore detention centres, and they are. You wouldn't care that hundreds of thousands of children are killed in the womb 
each year because they were inconvenient, unplanned, not the right timing, whatever. Perhaps we're not as different to the disciples as we might have thought. And on this, I want to flag an area where our culture is fast moving against children. And that's the area of children in the womb. And what's happening is that the same technology that is bringing amazing help to babies in the womb can and is being used against them as well. Now this might affect you down the track as a parent or whatever, but it might affect you if you're working in the health services industry as well. See, what if, uh, what if you found out that your family was about to expand and so you get a, a test done? kind of screening tests uh, on your baby. And uh, you find out that there is a risk that something is not right, that your baby may be abnormal. Would you have the courage to stick with the pregnancy, to keep the child, assuming there's no risk to the mother's safety? Would you trust our creator God to shape that little person's ability and even their lifespan? just as he wishes, even if there was great pressure on you to abort. And if you work in a hospital, are there some procedures that you would have to say, look, sorry, I can't in good conscience be part of this one? You've got to think this through carefully. You know, I'm not saying that this kind of antenatal testing is wrong by any means, but we live in a world where designer babies are starting to become the reality and, and the pressure will be on us to discard babies that are not viewed as perfect to treat them as VUPs as a burden on society and if you don't have the courage to face keeping a disabled child then perhaps don't have those tests at all you can see how it'd be important to think this through and pray it over and talk about it with trusted Christian friends or if you're a reader or you're a professional in this industry, you've got to get this book. It's by Megan Best, a doctor from here in Sydney. It's a Christian book, fearfully and wonderfully made. It's exceptionally good. There's a whole lot there about all these kind of questions. There's stuff there about uh, IVF, for example. How to uh, use that good gift from God in a godly way. Because... Infertility is absolutely gut-wrenching. It's extremely difficult. But in the desire to have a child, you don't want to cut corners and displease God. We're accountable to the Lord of the universe. We're accountable to the Lord who stepped down and called babies to him. Now, if you're feeling perhaps guilty about something from your past, a prayerlessness or a carelessness towards kids, be they unborn or born, what do you do? Well, the same as any time we feel guilty over sin, we repent and we run to Jesus. We run to Jesus. For he also says to us, come to me, come to me. And I, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will take your burden of sin. I will dissolve it in my blood shed on the cross. Come to me and enjoy 100% forgiveness. Well, a friend of ours is a uh, missionary in Thailand. Her name's Christina. She's a Swiss lady. She was so concerned about the abortion rate in that country, as here in other parts of the world, that she decided to open a centre to help uh, and support young pregnant women. It's a brilliant ministry. And uh, I think there's a slide, actually, we can put up. It's called the Fountain Ministry in northeast Thailand. And uh, she hears their stories. She offers to support them to, uh, to keep their babies. And uh, here's a young child whom the mother tried to terminate uh, last year. And the good news is the mother is now, uh, th 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 this baby is now much loved by the mother and also by the grandmother that lives with them. And uh, he is alive because of the prayers of many in the ministry of this particular lady in the name of Christ. And many women have come to Christ 
through this ministry as well. Let the little children come to me. I made them in my image. They're mine already. Let them come. Well, what's the mistake number two about children? It's to treat them as VIPs. Now, this might seem a bit wrong. I mean, we're just saying, uh, you know, not to treat them as unimportant. But we don't want to worship them either. And I've got to say this because child worship is, is all too common. And we never think of it that way in those terms. But, but people live for their kids. Spend for the kids. Compromise even for the kids. Weekends are dominated by what the kids do, their sport, their parties. Even if that means Sunday morning that you don't get them along to church. And this might be you guys down the track. You've got to think this through. Uh, their study is all that matters. They're all that appears on the Facebook page. And, uh, you know, the parents spoil them and the kids end up ruining the parents, really. And, of course, um, uncles, aunties, etc. can be guilty of that too. But look ahead a little bit into... Uh, it's actually next week's passage. A few verses down, verse 29. Truly I tell you, Jesus said to the disciples, no one who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. Now without taking away the thunder from next week as we think about this, take home point here is the kingdom of God comes first. Absolutely first. Not our kids or anyone else. They are not your Lord. They are not the primary purpose of your life. They must not be your idol. You have, shall have no other gods before me. And it's funny, you know, kids could be your idol and you don't actually have any. But you're thinking ahead. You have this picture in mind of uh, kind of married bliss nursing children. I'll tell you one of the, the clues that this might be an idol for you is you try and take a shortcut in who you date, you try and marry someone, doesn't matter they're Christian, non-Christian, whatever, you just want to be there with that, to get that picture for real in your life with the kids. It's an idol. Or if you do have kids, the dead giveaway they've become your idol is you become a helicopter parent. And uh, I don't know if your parents were like this in any sense, always hovering over the kids, always trying to protect them, overprotect them, unreasonably scared that they'll be hurt and taken away from you, so you smother them. And you never discipline them consistently. You argue with the teacher because the teacher dared point out that your little boy or girl might have actually had a behaviour problem. It's always someone else's fault, though, in your eyes. Of course, kids are helicopter parents. What do they do? They become a teenager, they reject all that, and I often reject mum and dad, and uh, so mum and dad end up losing them anyway, in a sense. As important as children are, they cannot replace Jesus as your number one VIP. Put him first. Trust him for your kids' future. Think of it this way. Your kids are part of your family that together you might serve God. Not God is part of your family that together you might serve your kids. Okay? Now, if you're thinking, this is not me now, believe me, down the track, you'll see the temptation. And it's good to have this clear in your mind now. Now, mistake number three is to treat children as Christians. Hang on, Mark. What if they are Christian? Well, I'm not talking about kids who can understand the gospel. I'm talking about very, very young kids. Traditionally, people have thought that sprinkling some holy water on them would become, they would make them Christian. So one church teaches, no other way besides baptism is seen as imparting the life of Christ to little children. Well, I'm all for infant baptism, but there's no way I could believe like that. That is so offline. Others have said children are innocent of sin, so have no need of a saviour. We can't think like that either. 
If we think that way, then we're not going to be praying and pleading for God the Spirit to enliven our kids and to bring them to a healthy faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, their own faith as they grow. We won't be teaching them to repent and to believe the gospel for themselves. We won't see the priority of getting them along to, uh, you know, kids' church and so on. But mum and dad bring me here occasionally, so I suppose Jesus is occasionally important for me too. We end up hindering them coming to Jesus. Or, fourthly, we can fall into the opposite trap and treat them as non-Christians. Now listen in carefully here because this is, there's a lot of room here for misunderstanding. But what do you say about the testimony? And this might be your story as you grew up. What do you say about the testimony of someone who has always known Jesus from the youngest age? And perhaps this is you. You can't think of a day when you became a Christian. And if you did pray a special prayer, say age five or whatever, were you really completely unsaved before then? If you had sadly died as a child, would there have really been no hope for your eternal future? These may be your questions. Do we really think that children of believers are unsaved until they profess Christ for themselves? We're talking little children here. Jesus' answer to our question might be right under our noses here. Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Such as these. Something that Jesus, uh, Jesus is making a comparison here. Uh, the kingdom of God belongs to anyone who makes themselves like a child before God. And that's, Jesus, that's certainly Jesus' point in the next verse, in verse 17. But is that all that he is saying here? So think of it this way. If I said about our song team who led us today, if I said talent, talent belongs to such as these... Now, I'm not saying there are people out there who show talent, but these guys don't have any. We're not saying that. The opposite. If I say talent belongs to such as these, then I mean these people are talented, don't I? They really are. See, the comparison only works if what I'm saying is true. And here, I think Jesus is doing the same kind of thing. He's saying that these kids are in the kingdom of God. They really are God's, eternally safe in Jesus' arms today in heaven as they were in his arms back there 2,000 years ago. Jesus did not say to them, repent and believe the gospel. If they were older, he would have. But he said, the kingdom of God belongs to such as you, to these babies. Now some of you have all sorts of questions, perhaps objections about that. Let me take a moment just to consider a few of those issues. But I've also put in some reading suggestions in your sermon outline from John MacArthur, from uh, Archbishop De Glenn Davies, our Archbishop here in Sydney. And that extra reading might be helpful. But let me say a few things. Number one, I don't mind if you disagree uh, with my understanding of this verse here, as there's ample evidence, I think, elsewhere in Scripture for this as well, that infants are saved. Secondly, I'm talking about children of believers here. So children of unbelievers, I think the Bible's less clear. And uh, we simply trust God to, to do what's right, of course. Uh, number three, God's character is probably the first place we want to look as we think about this. Would our loving and gracious God condemn infants? Kids who are not old enough to know God from creation and to know God from the gospel. Would he? Would not the judge of all, will not the judge of all the earth do right? Genesis 18, 25. Or Psalm 25, 8, good and upright is the Lord. That's our God's character. It's not that kids are innocent, by no means. <laughs> they quickly prove they're not. They have our sinful nature. But they're not old enough to be accountable. That's the key. So when Jesus accepts them here, I think it's one of the most beautiful pictures of grace in the Bible. 
It's a bit like that video, that sense of grace. These infants need to be carried to Jesus. They cannot come themselves, and yet Jesus accepts them. They are clearly saved by grace, not works. God elected to save them, and praise him, he did it. He did. Fourth thing to say, well, where else in the Bible might we look for this idea? Um, How about we go to the words of David in 2 Samuel 12, verse 23. King David's uh, baby dies, and, uh, but he actually, when the baby dies, he stops fasting and grieving. And he finds hope, saying, I will go to him, but he will not return to me. He stops grieving. He knows he will see his child again. But contrast that to when his older son, Absalom, dies later on. He is a rebel with clearly with no hope of salvation. And David just grieves inconsolably. It's such a contrast. Or we can go to Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 7, 14, where children are described as holy, or you could translate that as, as saints. Uh, or to Ephesians 6, 1, where children are to obey their parents in the Lord. In the Lord is significant. Young kids of believers are... God's kids under his covenant of grace. But remember, we still need to gospel them. Before long, they will confirm or deny their belonging to God by their own decision. You know, some will sadly turn their backs on their owner and their Lord. Others will recognize their own sin and their their deserved lostness without Christ and they'll lean on him in faith. So when a child of believers prays to receive Christ age five, I don't believe they've stepped from death to life necessarily. They have simply confirmed the life that they've had since birth. The Holy Spirit has brought them to recognize for the first time that they deserve certain death, that they might flee to Jesus and enjoy certain life. However, when a child of believers kind of goes off the rails and comes back to Christ age 20. Well, I think it's a different story, isn't it? Very different story. They become a Christian age 20. This sermon comes at a very sad time, actually, in the life of our congregation. I don't know if you picked it up from the emails and so forth going around the last week or two. But uh, just last week, John and Kobe Sarada's little boy, Isaiah, died in the womb, aged 30 weeks. Now, any miscarriage or stillbirth is devastatingly difficult. Devastatingly so, and this one, no exception. But as a church community, I believe we can rest assured that this child is in a much better place with the Lord, that he's spared so much of the pain of this life, although his family have to go through a horrendous pain. And so please keep them in your prayers. But rest assured, they will meet their son once more in heaven. It would be wrong to treat our kids as non-Christians. And I don't think we do that anyway. We teach them to pray. We comfort them with God's love. We, I think we have a good sense of this. We understand they are members of God's covenant until they're of age to confirm or deny God's grace for themselves. Well, I think there's one last mistake that we can make here about kids, and that's not to learn from them so verse 17 truly i tell you anyone who will not receive the kingdom of god like a little child will never enter it we've seen how jesus loves and honors kids here clearly but he also sees them as models of faith faith in their parents you know, just watch a kid, you know, kind of falling asleep in their mum or their dad's arms. They simply trust. Their head flops onto the shoulder and they go to sleep. And if mum puts some food on a spoon to their mouth, they'll try it. They're so dependent, they're so vulnerable even. They simply trust. In this chapter of Luke, Luke 18, we've seen a persistent widow. She trusted God in prayer. 
We've seen a tax collector just hitting his chest over and over, crying out, God, have mercy on me, the sinner. We're about to, next week, see a rich young man who would really struggle to uh, give himself over to God. But right in the middle of this chapter, I think you get this ultimate picture of faith here. This young child. And it's right that we... We think, we think through the kind of the big questions of science and faith and stuff like we did last week. It's right that we investigate, is the Bible true and is my faith well grounded in, you know, it's good to do that. But in the end, what is a Christian? It's a very simple picture here of trusting Jesus like a little child in arms. It's so simple. And I wonder if Jesus had Psalm 131 that we read earlier in mind when he said those words. Psalm 131, my heart is not proud, Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. But I have calmed and quieted my spirit. I am like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child, I am content. It's a picture of a Christian. Is it a picture of you? Of the five mistakes we make about children, this is the most important, isn't it? Are you being like a spoilt brat before God, unwilling to listen to him, not really trusting him, questioning, edgy, discontent of heart? Maybe it's time to come home to your heavenly dad who cries out to you, come to me, who wants to take that burden off you, who wants you to be able to rest in his arms and enjoy his presence, who wants to be able to comfort you that you're part of his family now and forever, who wants you to know that whatever goes on in life, he's got you, he's got you. Calm and quieten your spirit before him and let him be God to you. Will you do that now? Let me pray. And feel free to make this prayer your prayer. Our Father, my heart is not proud, Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me, but I have calmed and quieted myself. I'm like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child, I am content. Lord, my hope is in you, my trust, my future. I deserve nothing. I'm like a little kid being carried to you. How good I am doesn't doesn't cut it. I fall so, so far short of your perfection. I need you. I trust your grace in the Lord Jesus. His blood washes me and nothing else. I lean on you now, Lord, as a child. And in the power of your Holy Spirit, help me to love like Jesus did. Even to love little children. And we pray for your power and help in this, in Jesus' name. Amen.